probably little known to all of you here and who have been in the class since the new quarter, which this reflects, this class number 20 reflects the last quarter and the beginning of this one. Um, <clears throat> I think this is only our beginning our fourth class in this quarter that I've been able to teach. So, <clears throat> and we are still in the introduction. <laughs> so, but can you tell that it's important? It's really laying groundwork for what we're going to be seeing. So in Col <clears throat> Colossians chapter 3, <clears throat> This is verse 3. For you are dead. <clears throat> ah, praise God. Amen. That's the word of God speaking to us. For you are dead. And um, <clears throat> I wrote down that that was meant to communicate that we are in need of another life. Now, this, these words are spoken to the church at Colossa, and um, he says in verse 1, you know, if you then be risen with Christ. So there is a, there is, I mean, follow this. This is Colossians 1, Colossians 3, 1 through 3. It begins with, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. But then it immediately follows up with, for you are dead. Okay, now, which is it? Can anybody tell me? Well, it is the fact that we are risen and we are, we have been raised. That's not going to, that's, that's, that's past tense for you have been raised since you have been raised <clears throat> with Christ. Seek those things which are above. Set your affections on things above where Christ sitteth. Okay, well, that's the Lamb of God right there. That's the Messiah. The, the Lamb of God is the Messiah. I don't know how much people comprehend every time, every time that it says Christ means Messiah. And every time it says Messiah, it means the one that promised would come and deliver and do all these things that, that those who became believers found out were accomplished through the cross. Therefore, the Messiah is the, is the Lamb. <clears throat> Set your affections where he sits and not where you're trying to go. I want to go to streets of gold and gates of pearl and get my mansion on the hillside and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> um, but it says, Set your affection on things above, for you are dead. And your life, see, you're raised, but you are you are not, you know, and that's a completed work. Jesus did that as a completed work. You have been raised up and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, uh, Ephesians 2. And it's a completed work, but we haven't discovered the completed work. So, yes, that is our true state, but until... This lamb nature, this one, is revealed in us, then our life has not yet appeared. And that's what it says in verse 4. For you died, and your life is now hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, not your soon coming king or your savior or whatever. When Christ, who is your life, appears, so there's a, there is a, can we say it like this? There is a waiting in death to, to have our life revealed. And this is for Christians, not for sinners. Okay? So, um, <clears throat> and that's why I wrote, that was meant to, that for your dead, that was meant to communicate that we were in need of another life. But see, we all know that as I mean, in 
quote unquote deeper life circles. We all know that we need another life, but do we recognize that the image of God and the life that we're supposed to be reflecting or showing forth is the nature of the lamb? We just say, well, I need another life. And that other life is Jesus. You know, we just Jesus it. Well, Jesus is the Messiah, and the Messiah is a lamb. And in eternity, and you've heard me share on this before, but I mean, back, this was back when I was in Bible school when God first began to open, you know, my eyes to see the lamb. And it was apart from Berean fellowship or whatever, because they didn't put any emphasis in this area. And, and the Spirit of God was dealing with me, and he says, what, you know, what is your relationship with the Lord? I said, well, you know, I, you know, I pray, and you know, I, you know, and I read my Bible, and I, da 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 da. And he, he said, well, what is, what is he like? What is, you know, who is he? And I said, well, it's Jesus. And he said, well, it's the Lamb of God. And then he started bringing me through the scripture, and he took me to the scripture, says that he was a lamb slain before there was ever a world. And what that means isn't that he was slain for sin, because that's where we always go with the death. It's always a death for sin. It's never that that's his nature, selfless giving. So he's a lamb slain before there was a world. And, and in the book of Revelation, when it's all over with, he's seen as lamb, slaughtered lamb on the throne. And so then that's when the Holy Spirit said to me, so what, what do you think? You know, what do you think heaven's going to be like? I mean, do you think you're going to be casting out demons? Because you do a lot of that. Mm, no, no more demons. Do you think you're going to be healing the sick? No, no more sick. Do you think, you know, you're going to be just shouting about your salvation? Um, well, I thought we would. He said, you're going to be worshiping the lamb that was slain. That's what it says. See, but again, we tie that always with salvation. And we never, we, we see John, uh, uh, John the Baptist in John 1, 29, where it says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. But we never make it to the, what, th verse 35, somewhere in there, where it says, Just behold the Lamb. And this was, a, this was a beholding for disciples, not for sinners. And the disciples left John and followed Jesus. Followed, no, the Lamb. See? So, he, so the Holy Spirit just told me, look, <clears throat> if your relationship is with Jesus of Nazareth, you're going to be really surprised when you, you know, get before the Lord. Because you're not even going to know him. Because your whole existence is in the temporal realm of ministry. You could call it compassionate ministry. But you've never learned anything about him and and worshiping him in the true beauty of his nature. <clears throat> so, that life is Christ, but Christ who is our life does not appear simply because we need another life or merely upon receiving a salvation. He appears as our life only after we have truly embraced our death. So, there's no need talking about God revealing his son in me or any of this stuff, this is the order right here in Colossians, for you're dead. And when he appears, then you appear with him in glory. And then, then, then and only then do all of the rest of the verses from there on down in Colossians start talking. When it says mortify therefore the deeds of the flesh and this and that, the word mortify just means put to death. It's already dead with Christ on the cross. But you put it to death. You put it on that cross, as it were, and you do that by another nature. And so, anyway, I'm not, I don't want to get into all of the rest of it here, but in your King James Bible, it starts talking as it gets down into the, another image, his image. And it uses that word uh, image there. So, uh, but Christ, who is our life, does not appear simply because we need another life or merely upon receiving salvation. He appears as our life only after we have truly embraced our death, not theologically, 
but in the manner that will be outlined after these verses in Colossians. Many want to escape death, okay? So this is, this is common here. Um, there's so, so much explanations along this path, and if I just keep having to explain everything that, that should be foundational, it gets a little, uh, gets a little hard, but re- what I'm talking about is <clears throat> before we comprehend the lamb, death is an enemy. But death becomes our friend if Jesus dies. See? But we still fear death. Well, somebody says, well, we shouldn't fear death. We're Christians. When we die, we're going to be with Jesus. Well, okay, that's great. But guess what? We shouldn't be fearing death now. In circumstances, in situations, not just physical death, but in deaths. And Paul said, in deaths often was his explanation of his life um, that require putting others who may not deserve it before ourselves. You know, because that's, it's only a lamb death if it's somebody who doesn't deserve it, see. (laughs) If it's worthy of it, then it's not selfless giving, it's doing homage to somebody. So, he appears as our life only after we have truly embraced our death and not theologically, but in the manner that will be outlined in, in Colossians. Many want to escape death, suffering, and weakness. Okay? Death, suffering, and weakness. Limitations. Um, things, things in that category that God honors. He's chosen the weak things of the world and the this and that, not the noble and the wise and the things that we honor and that we think are the best. And, you know, well, I only want to go to the best. Well, you, do you know what the best is? <laughs> At least in God's eyes, do you know what that is? <clears throat> Their mind has not been renewed to God's view of death and the value of it to him. And notice the wording, the value of it to him. All right. I don't value death because, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm alive. I'm resurrected. I have, God has given me life. All I would say to somebody that has that argument is just, just go to the Lord by the Holy Spirit and ask him, show me in what manner you value death. And if you're sincere, he'll begin a process of showing you his heart. And his heart is the Lamb of God. That's everything to him, and it did everything. And he did it in death and slaughter and defeat, if you will. But it doesn't change, it doesn't change this innate thing that seeks to save. That seeks to save under circumstances. The only thing will change that is another image altogether. Oneness will bring you into that, but oneness isn't that. He is that. I mean, it's not, it is him. So um, even today among Christians, we see the same efforts to escape death, suffering, weakness, as did the Jews when Jesus walked among them. Why would anyone having this escape, escapism kind of mindset want to be raptured up to a throne that has a slaughtered, defeated lamb sitting on it and then set about worshiping, worshiping it for eternity? Did anybody catch that? If we're always trying to escape and so we're trying to escape everything, so I want to escape the great tribulation, and I want to escape the sufferings of my life, and I want to escape this, and I want to get out of this, and I don't want to have to face that, and uh, all these suffering, all these things, and all of that stuff. Then why in the world, with that mindset, would you want to be raptured out and go, yeah, I'm escaping, and then for eternity sit there and look at a slaughtered lamb on the throne and be called on to worship that for all eternity. That will be so 
contrary to your mindset. I'm here just to get out of stuff. He's here because he laid down his life and didn't try to escape anything. See? You see that? And, and those kind, you know, those kind of realities don't get said a lot in church. And when, you know, when I say them, I say them because we'll be confronted with these kind of things eventually. We'll be confronted with them eventually. And the question will be, and you, you've heard me talk several times about, you know, Jesus sitting on the throne, and the, the lambs and the goats come in, and then he separates them. Well, when they come in, they're not separated. They, the goats think that they're lambs. They probably think they're doing good until they see a lamb, and it's a slaughtered lamb, and then they think, you know, all I've done is try to get out of laying down my life. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? You know, the word idols is just another word for images. And is pretty much used interchangeably throughout the Bible. What agreement is there between, okay, two things, the temple of God and false perverted images? Okay, meditate on that for a second. What agreement could there possibly be between the place where God Set, set that he would habitate, that he would inhabit us, what agreement has that with false images in it? Us, the temple of God. False images in us. For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. <clears throat> what agreement of mine would the temple of God, us, have with false images? We are the temple of the living God which is the real intended image that should live in us. A real image. Let us make man in our own image. And man failed from that so he put his image in us. Our only responsibility is to conform to it. We are the temple of the living God, which is the real intended image that should live in us. God said, I, the crucified, will live in them. I, the crucified, will live in them and walk in them. Wherefore, come out from them and be ye separate from the perverted images. Wherefore come out. Does those words sound familiar to anybody? Book of Revelation. I mean, it's also uh, found in dealing with Babylon, which is in the book of Revelation. But it's in the book of Revelation, and it's come out from that false image called Babylon because if you stay there you're going to eventually have the image of the beast and you'll be treated just like the beast because you're a follower you're of that same spirit and that same image wherefore come out from them and be ye separate from the perverted images and I will father you and and put the correct seed in you, and you will be my kind of seed and son and image. Instead of being joyful over being caught up to the throne, we should be terrified. <laughs> but 
because of what we're looking at compared to us. If we don't have that image, we're going to be terrified. It's not going to be, praise God. You know, if you hadn't been worshiping that image here, you forget it. The image of the Lamb. Instead of being joyful over being caught up to the throne, we should be terrified if we are not in the correct image. That throne and the lamb on it will be for us turned to a throne of judgment. Judgment. What's, what's the judgment? He doesn't have to say anything. He's the judgment. He's the contrast. There's the judgment. Revelation 2 you don't have to turn there, I'll just read it. He who has an ear to hear, and then he says, to him that overcomes, by me, I, my parenthesis, by means of death, then I will give you the right to eat of the tree of life out of death. My little addition, additions in there. But that's what it's talking about. He who has an ear to hear, to him that overcomes, and, and I think I deal with it a little bit here, but I really get into it somewhere to show that the way Jesus overcame was through the cross. To truly overcome, as in the book of Revelation, is to get the victory over death. Not that you avoid it. Jesus got the victory over death by going through it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, because you're my life. You, you're, only your nature can comprehend death uh, suffering, loss, all of those things, and, and comprehend it in terms of victory and gain and blessing to others, because that's what the cross was, comprehended in a whole different light. But see, we can see it with Jesus on the cross, but we can't see it in our daily things because we're, we're still, like on the chart here, we're not, we haven't moved down here. In some cases, we're still letting others, you know, innocent ones do it for us, or the Lord will do it for us. But in the book of Revelation, he's calling for us to be the church, the, the bride, the body of Christ, the, you know, called out ones. Come out from that image and be joined to this image. The called out ones, see? The church isn't called the called in ones. Their, their whole deal to be churches, they have to be called out from that image. Be ye separate. And if they don't, then they're just called out from, well, I was, I'm part of the church. I was called out from drinking and cussing and, and doing wild, crazy things. And, you know, <laughs> I'm called out. Yeah, well, God will call you out on that because he's talking about something different. He's talking about calling you out of Babylon, out of that false image, perverted image. It's a perverted image. And the beast proves that. He proves that. You ever read Thessalonians where it talks about he will set him, his throne up as if he is God, and he does everything that God does, but it's, but it's not God because it comes through um, uh, a totally different spirit. The Lamb of God was given that place because he laid down his life. You know that from Philippians 2. Uh, that image there in Thessalonians got it because I will be something. I will be like the Most High God. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will, you know, and then you know, when you've earned it, then you get upset when somebody doesn't honor it. Well, I, I should be honored. I earned this beast image. To truly overcome, as in the book of Revelation, is to get the victory over death, loss, and unfair treatment. So we let such things work hope in us, according to Romans 5, hope maketh not ashamed, for the love of God is, what is it? 
Shed abroad in our hearts. Shed abroad in our hearts. Romans 8, 19 through 21 says, the creation waits in eager expectation for, and I wrote the, the words, for just like the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. Uh, he, he subjected, he, you know, we go, well, the devil did all this, the devil. It's a devil. My God, there's a devil. He subjected it into, what is it? I, I've, I've got it, was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. That's the NIV. He allowed it to happen because he's not afraid of death and loss and stuff because he's going to enter into it through death and he'll redeem it back because he understands the real way that this thing works. We would be afraid to subject anything to that for fear of loss and frustration and lack and the very things that, that keep it from ever being redeemed because there's no image of Christ to it. There's no, you know, even these lambs and calves and doves I mean they were so innocent they didn't know what was going on but at least they were given innocently but Jesus wasn't just given innocently Jesus willingly knew what was happening not just what was going to happen on the cross because of foreknowledge he knew what was going to happen because this is the way that he was going to redeem everything this is how I'm going to do it this is the, the platform upon which I work. This is according to my economy, my way of governing. This is how I produce all things. So he throws the sun up there and the sun is, you know, continually giving warmth and heat and making flowers grow and keeping, you know, everything nice and, and but we really examine the sun and we see that it is continually consuming itself. It is. It's continually consuming itself. It is being consumed, and the, and the end result of that being consumed is it's putting out light and heat. But it's like the, the uh, what is it with Moses, the burning bush. He was amazed because it was burning, but it wasn't consumed. It's going, it's selflessly given itself, but it still exists. This is a miracle. So, no, it's not a miracle. It's not a miracle. It is the way of God. You know? Sorry, I get a little carried away with some of this. <laughs> but by the will of the one who subjected the same in hope. And what was the, that hope? That something comes out of it. And here is what comes out, that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage. What bondage? Sin? No. To decay, to fear of loss, to being perceived as weak and from death. In other words, we, we are this creation and that God is trying to redeem us as well as the creation, but trying to redeem us because we were his creation in the beginning and it was subjected to those things in hope because hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad. And so he did that uh, to liberate us from bondage, from bondage. And the bondage he's trying to liberate us from is not sin, but fear of loss and being perceived as weak and fear of death and fear of looking bad and fear of somebody getting some position that I wanted and fear of, you know, not being honored when I should have been and fear of all that stuff. He's trying to liberate us from that kind of bondage, which we don't call it bondage. We call it uh, righteous indignation, injustice, all the things that the cross dealt with powerfully in the lamb giving himself. 
and all the things that will turn everything around in the book of Revelation. It will defeat beasts, it will defeat Babylon, it will defeat everything, and it'll turn into this glorious bride of oneness out of whom the lamb, slaughtered lamb's being will flow out and bring healing, not this time from a, a godly touch from a holy man, but this time from a death that, that took place and that lamb is still in that spirit, see? Not just the death of the cross, not just the death of the crucifixion, but the self-giving death that he is like the son constantly being consumed and yet he lives. Constantly giving and yet he remains. He never loses power. It's amazing. I mean, the son is amazing. Right? <clears throat> and brought into, not just, not just delivered from bondage, liberated from bondage, but brought into the glorious freedom, self-giving without fear of the children of God, the sons of God. The, the glorious freedom of self-giving without fear for the sons of God, the children of God. Isaiah 53, 12, and you don't need to turn there either. I'll just read it for you. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great. This is talking about, you know, Isaiah 53, and Isaiah 53 deals with the lamb, and it deals with, you know, that he was, uh, uh, he was wounded for our transgressions selflessly took it. He was bruised for our iniquities. By his wounds, glory to God, by his wounds, our wounds are healed. Not by his magic, not by his, his supernatural God power to heal. By him being wounded, ours become healed. It's powerful. It is incredible. It lives in me. It works in me. What I mean is, is that, that I just revel and dwell and meditate constantly on that, that by his wounds now. And so I see in the book of Revelation, I see the wounded lamb. I see the slain lamb. And I see the flow of life coming and by it downstream they're being healed by his wounds, by that slaughtered lamb. Not, again, not just by Jesus of Nazareth having supernatural powers of healing, the gift of healing. It's not that. This is, I'm going to say it like this, and please don't misunderstand it, but this is God healing, not God kind of healing. This is God healing. This is a healing that flows out from the nature and the way of God in their selflessness. And it works. Yeah. Well, that, right. And therefore, it brings healing to other people. But he's still slaughtered, and yet he lives. See? And doesn't Paul say that somewhere where he says, and we are, we are, Da, 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 and yet we live. We are accounted for death. We are accounted for death, and yet we live. It's that same spirit. It's the sun burning. It's the Lamb of God as a slaughtered lamb flowing. It is, you know, and Paul's walking in it and living in it and, and producing in it and changing things. And just like that flow that came out of Jesus. And it, changed the desert and it and it brought trees and fruit trees and and all of these things to the to the people downstream but it's still self-giving to people downstream but the the bride of Christ is not downstream she is so one with him Yes, Lord. Therefore, I will give him, because he, you know, 
we saw that he was wounded. We saw that he was bearing, the had sin. Sin was on him. It was our sin, but we didn't see that. We just saw, you've got sin, and you're all putrefying with your wounds and all this stuff. And, and we hid, as it were, our faces, our faces from him. We hid our faces. Our, not, you know, I mean, we may give him our hands. We may give him our money. He looks like a beggar. Let's give him some money. But we hid our faces because that was ugly to us. And it's not ugly. It is the beauty of the Lord, this self-giving nature, you know. And, and that's why he, his scars are that way. And that's why in, in Exodus 21 that the, that the wife that, that could have, the, the husband could have left and left his children, left his wife and everything there. And he said to his master, no. And his master took him and pierced his hands as, and his ears, actually pierced his ears. And it was proof of love, God's kind of love. God's kind of love. And so after the transaction was done, he stayed a servant for the rest of his life. He only had to be one for a certain amount of time. But by, doing, by being pierced, he said to his master, I'll stay here. I'll stay here. And the wife when the kids are in bed, she's sitting there at his feet and she looks at the wounds, just like the bride, sitting at Jesus' feet and looking at his wounds and, and just knowing what they mean, not just ugly scars, knowing what they mean. Oh my God, you've given everything that is you that we might be. And to see that, and the, and the tears that would drop on those scars and the kisses that would fall upon there because there was a comprehension of beauty, not ugliness. I'm just going to finish this part. It's just a short part, and then we'll quit. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great. See, because he went through all of this. Therefore, I will get, see, this is the way it works. This is a perfect example. This scripture is giving us the thing. The thing that we're so afraid of, of being marred and looking bad, or, oh, no, I don't want to look bad. Well, would you look bad for others? You know, no. Would you look bad for me? Yes. Well, I want you to look bad for others, <laughs> to, to others and just to see if you'll be with me. Uh, yeah, I'll be with you. I want to be with you. Will you be scarred for me? Will you be rejected for me? Will you be unloved for me? Will you be considered an outcast or something like that? Go with, will you go to me outside the camp? Because it doesn't say go outside the camp. It says yeah. that you go to him. You go to him. You don't care. You know, everybody inside the camp, whoa, we're holy and we're the people of God. Out there, you're rejected. And that's what he says. Bearing my rejection, my reproach, better word, perfect word from the scripture. Bearing my reproach. Yeah, Joseph. We, we did as it were our faces. The face is the image. We, we hid our God intended image. We hide that. Yes. To yes. have the image of the worship oh. the creature, not the creator. Yeah. Of him. That's it, brother. That's it. it. We hit our faces because, see, our face is supposed to look into his face.
because we're not going to get it. We're just not going to get it by going, oh, Holy Spirit, teach me. We look into his face and we're changed into that same image from glory to glory. But when we hide our face, exactly what you said, then we're totally, as it were, unknowingly, but rejecting the image of the crucified, the image of the Lamb. And we're going, I don't, you know, and that's why <clears throat> some churches are huge. Because you present an image of prosperity and blessing and everything's going to be wonderful. And just rebuke the devil and God will get you healed over here and everything's going to turn out fine. And <clears throat> that's fine if you're living downstream, amen? If you're, if you're living downstream, shout and splash around and everything you want to do. Because I did it. You know, messing up my parade. But God dealt with me at a certain juncture. And when he did, I couldn't resist because I knew it was him, not of him. That was of him. This was him. And it said, you come to me and you come to me in a whole different spirit and a whole different understanding and relationship with me in oneness. And if you do that, if you do that, you will see my face. Because in the face of Jesus Christ is the knowledge of God, the true image, the fullness that it's all the way, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, not just Jesus. And you will look into my face. And what's funny is it, it's probably a slaughtered lamb type face. It is there you see and there you understand and you you know I mean I, I think that people I think people's image of Jesus of Nazareth is right Jesus of Nazareth but Jesus of Nazareth died and the lamb you know dis, and he disappeared and then the lamb was seen at Calvary the lamb was seen there the eternal lamb, that which was from the beginning, John says, we have seen, we have handled with our hands, and we have looked upon. He's talking about what was from the beginning. He didn't say, we saw Jesus of Nazareth, and we worked with him for three and a half years, and it was special, man. It, that's what we would have said. I, I walk with Jesus. Let me tell you about all the stuff I saw. John says that which was from the beginning, we have seen, we have handled We've touched of the word of life, not the scriptures or the word of, of Jesus of Nazareth. Not the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. We have, we've actually seen what was from the beginning, and when we touched him, we, we touched that. We could have just touched Jesus of Nazareth, but we touched that because we knew that when we were with him, we were drawn closer to something that was eternal and not the ordinary teachings and thoughts. Not the thoughts of man, but the thoughts of God. Not just the thoughts of God, but the heart of God. The heart of God. The heart of God. Did I say I was going to get through this? I'm going to do it. Therefore, I, I will give him a portion among the great and will divide the spoils among the strong because... He poured out his life unto death. I'm going to make him, I'm going to do this because he poured out his life unto death. Now, I'm not going to do this because he was a great man. I'm going to do it because he became the lowliest of men. In fact, it says because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the tr transgressors. He, was, he allowed himself to be numbered with the transgressors. Because Jesus understood also this eternal way, this, this ancient path. He understood it. He is it, I mean, as it were. And so God says, God looks at, God looks at all that horrible stuff in Isaiah 53 and then says, and because, therefore, because you have gone through all of this in a right spirit I'm going to do this for you 
And not just that he poured out his life, but he allowed himself to be numbered with the transgressors. None of us want to be numbered with the transgressors. None of us want to be thought evil of. None of us want people to, well, oh my God. I mean, I'm, I'm hearkening back now to, to Mary of Bethany. Oh my God, what's this prostitute doing at Jesus' feet, you know? Uh, these reactions that are so religious, so right, but so opposite of good and evil. Tree of life. So opposite. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors, not for the good, not for the righteous. And then I'm just going to add this, Revelation 5, 9, and they sang a new song. You are worthy because you were slain. <laughs> oh, I don't even know what to say. Except thank you all for letting me sh not just share the word, but pour out some of the things that's being poured in me. <clears throat> Honestly, I'd, I'd been sick for a while, and I was afraid I wouldn't even be able to get through one class. <clears throat> I'd been also very weak. But to be able to, to speak words that I'm not worthy of and to release a spirit that is not mine is, uh, you know, it's just incredible. So thank you all. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for Jesus and that his, his heart and his desire <clears throat> is so far beyond our Christian ways and thoughts. We say your ways are not our ways, but the truth is your ways are not our Christian ways and your thoughts are not our Christian thoughts. Your, they relate so much more deeply to beauty as you understand it and to death as you understand it and to a whole nother realm, a new creation that is not after the old, uh, that we just, we will try to pattern everything that you say after the old understanding and the old creation. But your spirit is strong and he loves, he loves you, Jesus, and he is, he is active and he is alive and he will break the bread of life to us and he will hover over us and he will show us what we cannot see of ourselves, of you, Jesus. Pray that you will bless, continue to bless our gatherings as we not just come for class, but we truly from our hearts gather at your feet, Jesus. May we pour out back on you after all this that you've given us and poured out on us. May we, may we be mindful of your wounds, of your heart, of your scars of the things that man would call ugly about you. May we be mindful of the beauty of it. So we thank you, Lord. Bless these sharings tonight and the ones that we'll have in the future in Jesus' name. Amen. We're dismissed.